to emphasize is that these are the things we know GLASS is going to do. With such a huge leap in capabilities, I'm expecting that the most important science that GLASS is going to do that we're going to be talking about years from now is actually not yet on anybody's list. So that brings us to GLASS. The next graphic, please. You've put here the same sky map on a slightly different color scale for comparison for what Egret gave us after nine years of its operation. And if you go to the next slide, keep this in mind and go to the next slide. This is what we think GLASS is going to give us in just the first year uh, of observation. And this is the thing that just has us so incredibly uh, excited because we see that it has enormous uh, discovery capability. Now, what makes this all possible? Next slide, please. Uh, Kevin showed you the beautiful GLASS observatory. Uh, on top is the Large Area Telescope, or the LAT. It covers the high energy end of the electromagnetic spectrum from 20 million electron volts to greater than 300 billion electron volts. Remember, an electron volt is about the energy we see with our own eyes. And the GLASS burst monitor, or the GBM, and you see its components uh, down uh, toward the bottom part of the instrument, covers the complementary energy range for gamma ray bursts, the lower energy end from about 10,000 electron volts to 25 million electron volts. When you put them together, the GBM and the LAC will cover an unprecedented factor of 10 million in energy range. So if, if glass were a piano, it alone would cover about 23 octaves. And this is another thing that has us uh, incredibly, uh, incredibly excited. As Kevin said, the LAD offers a very large field of view, 20% of the sky at any instant. And in sky survey mode, in just two orbits or three hours, we're able to expose all parts of the sky for about, uh, about uh, 30 minutes. Getting back to that energy range, um, in addition to this very large energy range, GLASS is about to open up one of the last poorly measured regions of the electromagnetic spectrum for about 10 billion electron volts to 100 billion electron volts, or 10 GeV to 100 GeV. This has been an incredibly challenging part of the electromagnetic spectrum to use to explore the universe, um, and we only really now have the technology to do it. So GLASS offers one of the great leaps that GLASS offers is the ability to open this uh, energy band up for exploration. In the history of astronomy, indeed all of science shows, that when you open up a new capability, you can expect surprises. And we're just about to fill in this missing piece in the electromagnetic spectrum. So I think you can see the impacts of GLASS data will be felt across a broad range of science topics. And again, what we're uh, also very excited about are the surprises. I'd like to uh, now move to the instruments uh, themselves just a bit more and the uh, science collaborations uh, that uh, together uh, with a very large number of extremely talented uh, engineers, technicians, uh, programmers, and support people all work together as a team to make GLASS a reality. Without having these key collaborations, international, uh, multi-agency, multicultural, the particle physics, astrophysics connection, and having teams of talented scientists, engineers, programmers, technicians, and support people all working together. That's what's enabled this uh, great leap in capabilities. So uh, I would like to now uh, turn uh, to the instruments. If we go to the slide on the lap, please. Um, good, if you can go, right, thank you very much. So the LAT is a telescope without lenses because gamma rays interact with matter so differently from the way optical light interacts with matter. You can't build very easily a lens or a mirror for the gamma rays. Instead, we take advantage of this remarkable process of converting the gamma ray energy into an electron-positron pair. And all we have to do is track those electrons and positrons and the other products that come out of this conversion uh, with charged particle tracking detectors. And from that, we can infer the direction of the gamma ray and uh, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, how do we do the tracking? Well, these instruments are absolutely beautiful. The tracking is done by about 70 square meters of high-tech silicon strip detectors that give us a very precise measurement of the direction that the particles uh, take. And I'll show you a little bit of a graphic about that. And those 70 square meters are arranged in 36 planes and connected to about 880,000 channels of electronics. Underneath the tracker is a calorimeter that measures the energy of the gamma rays. And uh, it's composed of about 1,536 individual 
uh, detector elements called cesium iodide uh, crystals, and that calorimeter has a mass of about one and a half tons. The whole lab together has a mass of about three tons and uh, operates on an amount of power that's about 650 watts or equivalent to about half of what an ordinary handheld hair dryer uh, uses. So that's, again, a, a, a tremendous advance. And then as Kevin described, surrounding the whole thing is a charged particle veto detector, which uh, lets us know that it was a charged particle and not a gamma ray that entered uh, the detector. And it's tied together by an electronic system that uh, is really, uh, uh, that makes the whole thing uh, work out and uh, uh, work uh, together as a unit. If I could have the movie, please. So here's the observatory on orbit, and we're showing one of those segments. So you, you see this segment, but in fact, it all works together as one uh, unit. There's the neutral gamma ray not leaving any tracks, and it's now split to an electron-positron pair. And those particles rattle around as they pass through the material, but they leave these hits in the tracking detector, and then we do the detective work to reconstruct the tracks and then point back to the direction on the sky from which the gamma ray came. About two times a second, a gamma ray will enter the instrument from over the whole field of view, and uh, thousands of times a second, a charged particle will go through the instrument. Okay, again, I'd like to stress that this all only worked because of teaming of all of these uh, dedicated uh, people from uh, around the world. Uh, Kevin showed you uh, uh, most of those contributions, and it's what's really made the whole thing uh, possible. Finally, uh, there's the glass burst monitor, or the GBM. Uh, and the GBM's primary science goals uh, tell us, uh, are, are there to tell us uh, about, uh, uh, the GBM connects the uh, frontier energy measurements that the LAT is going to make with a much better studied uh, energy regime at lower energy that previous NASA satellites and other worldwide satellites uh, have told us. So the GBM will connect the breakthrough lat energy uh, measurements with the, uh, with the uh, previously understood energy range. In addition, gamma ray bursts appear unpredictably from anywhere on the sky. The GBM observes the whole sky, and so that will be a very important uh, aspect as well. Okay. Uh, finally, I'd like to uh, show you in uh, one graphic, the next graphic, please. Uh, our overall science operations timeline, which you can also find at our uh, website, uh, nasa.gov slash glass. And you see, as Kevin described, that in the first two weeks, we'll be turning on the observatory, checking it out. In the third week, we'll begin to turn on the instruments. And then we begin our preliminary uh, tuning uh, of the observatory. For about a month, month and a half, we're doing some basic, uh, very simple uh, configuration checkout calibrations. We'll be able to take a, a first light image during this time. And then we begin, after 60 days, our, um, our uh, first year of science operations. And that's when uh, all the information uh, about the gamma ray sky begins to flow out uh, to the entire